Hello and welcome back to the channel. Uh, today we're going to talk about hardware and especially how to set up the Cube IDE with TouchGFX on custom hardware. Um, so I start off the same way I started off with the first project setting up uh, the hardware uh, configuration in the in the integrated uh, MX setup in, um, in the Cube IDE and instead of uh, selecting the, the development board and using the, the standard options for that. Uh, instead, I'm going through all the pins uh, on the microprocessor. In my case here, I have selected the 176 pin version of the STM32 F746. Uh, the same that is available on the disco board. Uh, and I have done this previously, so what I'm doing now is that I'm uh, assigning pins here and I'm I don't know how familiar you are with the with the cube MX setup uh, this is pretty new to me uh, still but the thing is that if you if you don't know which pins a peripheral is going to use you can just find it and for example under connectivity here you can set the, take this FMC and set up the interface and it will give you some pins but if you do know which pins you are going to use you can go uh, through the, the setup here uh, for example, here I have uh, the Quad SPI uh, on, uh, I know that PF7 is not going to be used, so PF8, I can just click this and say this is going to be the IO0, and then I'll get a little pin symbol here. That means that this pin is not allowed to change uh, within the cube setup. And you can see here now I selected the last one, all the pins turn green. That means that we have a valid Quad SPI interface available, and these are pinned so they cannot change. The same way we have the FMC interface, which is uh, for the SD RAM. Uh, this is pinned, but it's yellow because it's not valid yet. I'm still missing some uh, some pins. And uh, also here you can see LCDC. That's the display interface. Um, it's not pinned because it's also assigned. So at some point you have assigned enough pins. So there's no combina combinations left. Uh, these pins are not pinned, so they can change. I can right click this and say signal pinning. Uh, so now I make sure that the pins don't change anymore. Uh, let me just check. I'm referring to another screen where I have uh, the, the right setup. So that's why you see my mouse uh, sliding off and on screen all the time. Here, this is the FMC line and this is an FMC line uh, this one here uh, and you can see down here actually we have the system proposes that the R0 and R1 are going to be on P PH2 and PH3 uh, ports uh, they are not going to do th be that in my design so this one is going to be the R2 and this one here when I change this to R1 you can see that it changes and then R0 is, is right so I'll just be right clicking and say pin this um, the same way I have up here, uh, we're going to be, uh, need a, a digital uh, output for uh, for enabling the display. I'm going to place this on PD4. So PD4 here is not going to be, uh, it's, it's not an assigned uh, pin, it's not a known pin in the interface, so we can assign this however we please. So I'll just assign this as a GPIO output, like this. It's going to be pinned uh, automatically and you can right click it and then enter a user label. And for this label, I'm going to write uh, LCD underscore DISP like this. So I know that this is my LCD underscore DISP. Uh, this is a sin signal that enables the, the display. All right, so I have done all the configuration here. You can see that, the, that for example, the uh, FMC interface is still yellow. So I'm going to enter into the configuration of the FMC here. And I know that I'm going to use an SD RAM. Uh, it's going to be uh, clock zero, uh, four bangs and uh, 12 bits. You can see now uh, the pins are turning, turning green as we speak here. The data is going to be 16 bits turning green. That's nice. Uh, and then we can go uh, continue with the, with the setup of this. And I'm going to come back to, to these values in a bit, um, but let's start with the with the display setup. So in order to get um, get the display uh, working, we need to go to 
uh, multimedia here. And then we're going to select the DMA 2D and just activate this. Uh, let me just check if we are going to use, yeah, we're going to use the global interrupt like this. Uh, the parameters here are going to be RGB 888. So it's a 24 bit uh, interface with don't change anything else. So this is just the interface. Um, then I'm going to LTDC um, and set this up. So I think uh, this is a time where I emphasize that I have just taken the disco board, the uh, F746 disco board and made a bare bones copy of this. Uh, I have made, I found another display from bydisplay.com, uh, a 4.3 inch uh, LCD screen with a capacitive touch interface, very much like the, the RockTech display uh, on the disco board. Uh, I've removed the Ethernet inter interface and I've removed the USB host, the ST-Link that is on board, the audio, uh, the sound card and the camera interface, the memory card interface and the SPDIF interface. So I've taken away as much as possible from the hardware. Uh, I have a design in, in TCAL, two layer design is not very pretty, but it's uh, specifically made for testing out the SD RAM interface, the display interface and the quad SPI interface. Uh, if you're interested in the hardware design uh, as such, drop me a line and I can talk a bit about that and maybe even upload the design if you're interested. Um, so I've spent quite some time figuring this out and there is an app note called 4861 which goes into uh, detail uh, about how to uh, inst or adjust the um, the parameters for the for the display here uh, so let's have a look at that app note for a second so this is the app note here that goes through uh, different issues and or not issues, different concepts about uh, how to implement a, a touchscreen. And what is interesting is that it has this example here. Yes, here it is on page 55 of this app note, the AN4861. So this is the LCD timings uh, from the RockTech display, which is available on the disco board. And what is interesting here is the display period back port, front port, and pulse width uh, for both H-Sync and V-Sync. So we have the horizontal, which is uh, the pixel ones, and then V-Sync, which or the vertical, which is the lines themselves. So we have 480 pixels by 272 lines. So if I just remove this for a second here, like this, uh, the app note goes over how to, to, to take these values here and convert them into the horizontal synchronization width and the back porch and the front porch and it's pretty straightforward these so for my display we end up having a value of four here we have a value of 43 uh, the active width is of course the 480 pixels uh, we've got eight pixels here now we can see you, you ha we have some calculations done here which is the actual numbers that will be inserted into the, the cube ide project down here we have two lines, we have eight lines, we have 272 lines and 12 lines here. So uh, for my display here, I also have uh, uh, active high signals down here, but that's just about it. For the layer here, we ha only have one layer. Uh, it starts at zero and ends at the end of the screen like this. The app note do go into a little bit of detail about these uh, layers and how you can add them on top of each other. Uh, my color or pixel parameters are eight, eight, RGB 888, so we've got 24 bits of color here. Alpha constant is 225, and alpha the blending factor is alpha constant times pixel alpha. And honestly, I have no idea what this means as of yet. Probably will in a few weeks. Um, these are copied from the existing the, the 746 disco board and it works. What is interesting down here is that we have the color frame buffer or the zero color frame buffer start. This is the address and this is set to uh, the hexadecimal address of the starting point of the SD RAM. Like this. 
uh, and then we set the frame buffer size uh, to the same size as our display here, like this. Um, and we have to go to the GPIO settings. I should just remove this uh, for a second. Um, maximum output speed sets the slew rate of the output drivers. And we the, the displayed output system here is, is a high speed uh, interface. So if we select all of these, we just scroll down and press shift. And so I can change the configuration for all these pins at the same time. And then set the maximum output speed to very high, like this. And then I can uh, click a one, single one and then press control, click again. So you see now the, all the pins are set for very high speed. So this means that the pins can be driven at the speed that is required to perform or generate the LTD signal. All right, um, let's see. We still have some, uh, if we go back to the chip, we still have some, we still have some, some yellow uh, ports here we have the FMC is not configured correctly um, let me just see if we can find that uh, that's under connectivity here okay um, and I will just mirror the the settings from here it's uh, from my while working project and I will get back to this I will just make sure that all uh, the pins are set so so it will work. I will get back to why these numbers are what they are because that is pretty important. I spent the better part of a week figuring these numbers out. Uh, so let's uh, get back to this. Actually, these are not even the right numbers. So let's see here. Let me just do like this. Set uh, the GPIO settings. We also have to check that these are set to very high because we need them to be. Uh, the SDRAM interface is having a clock of around uh, 100 megahertz or 66 megahertz, depending on your divide divider settings. But let's um, let's not talk about that right now. Uh, the quad SPI here we have um, we have um, let's see here we have uh, bank one with quad SPI lines. Uh, there's no specific settings for this. It's pretty important to know that the parameter settings here, they, um, if you do uh, do this on uh, on the development board, these are not copied the, uh, over. Uh, so the default values are wrong. So that if you're struggling with getting the quad SPI to work, uh, these are some of the values you need to change. So I'll just go through um, some of the, the other thing you need to uh, enable, for example, here in CSC, you need to activate the CNC. There's not that you need to do anything uh, about it. Uh, for the connectivity here, I want to have the I square C one. I want to have that as I square C here. You can see the pins turning green. I square C three uh, also av available. Um, Yes, and now I'm going to have the user at one uh, as asynchronous and the user at six asynchronous. And also I want to have uh, the global interrupt enabled. And that's just because I want to be able to have the code generated for, for the interrupt routines that I'm using later on. Also, if you're watching a previous video where I interrupt and implement the, the ring buffer, uh, this is the way we make sure that the, that the interrupt is generated. We need to go to uh, the system core here and under the uh, sys here, we need to enable serial wire for debugging. Also, I need to go to the RCC here and we have, uh, I have a crystal or a ceramic resonator here for, for the high speed clock here. Okay. Let's see if we have anything else we need to take care of right here. Uh, obviously RCC, the sys, there's nothing else. Uh, we don't change anything else here. Uh, oh yeah, and the timers, I'm using the timer six. Um, we need to change that, that is available in the in the sys, yeah. Sys here, we need to, uh, 
have the time base sorter. I'm using timer six for this, so that disables the timer six altogether. I have, I'm using uh, a few of the timers for PV PWM generation. So I'll just go through these. And if you think that this hardware configuration is a bit dull, you can just skip to a later part of the movie. Uh, I will just go through this because then I know that my board is set up the right way. Uh, okay. There's nothing much to tell you about this point. I'm just essentially copying my my program or not my program, my hardware options or not options, my hardware setup. So uh, in order to have all the all the peripherals set up the right way. And a lot of this comes from copying just the, the original the board. See that we only have we only have this this up here, the P one, the NBL zero one and zero. These are the only ones that are not configured yet. So let them that is the FMC here. I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, that is strange because that is indeed set up. Oh yeah, byte enabled. 16 byte enabled. There we go. So I'll go get back to the to the SD RAM con uh, setup in in a while. The the focus for this video will be that we start with the display and then we uh, go to the SDRAM and then maybe have a talk about the touchscreen in the end. So the first thing, uh, and also uh, if you follow the, the app note, the 4861, is that we need to get the, uh, the display to work. We need to test everything out by themselves and see if, if, if it works. Um, so I'll just attach or um, connect the touch GFX to this as well. Here uh, we'll go to um, we'll add uh, the free ultras, the CM Sys version one like this. I don't change anything for now here, and then let's see if we can go select touch GFX. Yes, and the, we can select the parallel interface using LTDC here. Um, you can see platform setting is having an exclamation mark here, and that's because we need to have this reset pin set. And what is interesting here is that we can only select pins that we ourselves have defined as GPIOs. So if you don't have any values here or any solutions uh, in this drop down box, you need to define, uh, just select the pin and set it to GPIO output uh, because then you can select it here. In my case, I selected uh, or made this LCD underscore disk. Uh, maybe you remember that I renamed the pin so we can see it here, it's PD4 on LCD underscore disk. I choose this. So now the platform settings check to a, a change to a check mark. Okay, uh, we don't change uh, anything here. At least I don't think so. Let me just check here. Uh, nope. Uh, so if I go to touch GFX here, I can press execute. And then the touch GFX designer will start up. Uh, and in this designer, I'll just create, oh yeah, the first thing we need to do is just, just have it here. Um, we'll go down here and say browse code. You may maybe notice you'll have this error during code generation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the touch GFX file with a text editor. And it looks like this. And then scroll down to the bottom, it's not a very long file. We have this post generate command. Now I'll just delete this and then I'll write echo test uh, and save this and close this. And now the project was modified externally. Do we want to reload the project? Yes, we do. Uh, here we are. So it still says error during code generation, but that's just because we haven't done anything yet. So I will just take a box like this uh, and make a Let's make a red background and I will put a button on top of this. It's not really important what we do here. Uh, I'll just create a symbol, yeah, something. And I'll press generate code like this. And now you can see the code generation is complete. We can close this. 
and we can go back to our hardware configuration. Um, a very important thing to do now is to go to clock configuration and we have to change all of the clock setup. So I have uh, an external crystal or crystal oscillator running at 25 megahertz, so that is fine. Um, so the first thing here is that we change uh, the PLL source marks to the high speed external uh, oscillator. My PLLM is, for my case, uh, 25 here, and my multiplier here is 400, like this. Divider P is 2, and now I can select PLL clock here over in my MUX, and I can choose this. Now I can see um, that the HCL, HCLK here is 200, which is fine. This is 1, this should be 4. That's a two, and this should be a two as well. So yes, of course you cannot have any red boxes here. Um, if you don't have a clue what to go on, look at how the development board is set up and what uh, values they have there. For now, you can see that I have a 40, 20, 48 megahertz signal to my LCD, which is way beyond what it can handle. Um, in the development board, it's nine and a half megahertz. I will be running at nine. But that really is up to you and what your display can handle. Uh, I won't be using the S, uh, you can see this uh, divider down here or the PLL I2S is going up to the SPDIF uh, RX. I don't want it, I don't change this uh, because I don't have to. So I'll be focusing on, on the PLL SA, SAI1. Uh, and this one will be changed to five and this will be changed to eight. And I have had huge troubles with this box here. Uh, it will simply, it will not, <laughs> the drop down is really annoying here. Um, I don't know if I'm click, I'm just clicking a lot of times and different places and I can't get it to stick. <laughs> this is just ridiculous. I need to change this to, 360 so i will just pause the video recording for a moment and then yell at my screen for a second and then i'll fix this all right so there we have it it took <laughs> way too long let's just uh, keep it that way um so i changed this and you can see now uh, we have the nine megahertz to the lcd tft um Previously, I have told you that you have one shot to, to, to adjust all this. And the problem is that at this current moment, the, the, the Cube MX integration overrides a lot of settings um, that is required by the Touch GFX. Uh, so you need to exclude a lot of stuff and it, it, it gets back inside the project. Um, so what we will do now is that I will uh, use Control S to save this project. I will uh, probably get, uh, no, I don't get one, but there, it will generate the, the CubeMX code for this. Let's just see what how it goes. Uh, okay, and let's try to build this. Well, I will get a lot of errors at this point, but that doesn't matter. Um, you can see here that we have this uh, stl2, stl underscore video dot h, that is from the uh, the, the simulator in um, in the touch GFX. So we need to exclude a lot of stuff, but luckily there's a, a, a nice trick for that. So if you go to, to GitHub um, to uh, replace Mike here, uh, Mike, Michael Brown, uh, he has written in the forum previously and provided this very, very handy tool. Uh, I'll suggest that you go to and find his, uh, the latest release and you use the standalone version and in the standalone version you will have a folder like this with a lot of a uh, lot of files but you will have a, an exe file down here and let me just run this um, so if I r run this like this the standalone version uh, has all the dependencies uh, right next to the, to the project, which is very, very nice. Um, Michael have done an excellent job because now we can just uh, 
we can patch use this tool to patch the project and the tool will remove all the simulator references so for example i can write like this uh, dash p and then we just have to provide the address for the for the 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 project and i have that right here you can see i have browsed to my to my project file and you can see that's where the ioc file that was the hardware configuration we have the project file here so i just copy this here and insert it into the tool and then control v and then hit enter and it says successfully patched and you can see there's a backup file here the project file is, has been backed up the project oh uh, the tool always does that um this tool requires um a few things in order to work so right now the ioc file is still open i can close this and we can start programming that's fine but if i go back in like this you can see this initializing device configuration tool uh it, i can change just a single setting i can go for example here to ggio and change my i have this ltd test which an which is an uh it's an led <laughs> so it should be called, be called led test like this uh, and my output setting uh, should be high. So now it will be on when I turn on my microcontroller. Um, I've got my camera, so we can see in a while that this LED indeed turns on. But now we have changed, you can see with the, this little star up here, that we have made changes. So when I uh, press Control S and save this, it will generate the code again, which effectively means that the changes that was made by the tool uh, are no longer uh, valid so it will uh, the build will fail because uh, the simulator files have been included again what is interesting is that when you get this error here and press ok with just reason internal error press ok then you will be able to run your tool again just press uh, arrow up and then press enter if this error uh, if we don't close this window here but just change the setting this could be to low for example uh, and then save it we won't get the same uh, code generation as before and the tool will say this no patch required so if you get this uh, error so to speak close down the IOC file and open it up again do your, do a, some changes any changes and save it get the error and then you can update the, the, the workspace again what I can do now is I can press build um, like this, I just close this because I don't may have to make sure that it's closed. When I press build now, um, it should succeed. Uh, let me just try that one more time. Yes. So we get one error uh, because of a definition thing, but now we actually have a working project that is being built on the, uh, for the, for the custom board. What one warning, and now we can actually program this if we wanted to. Um, we want to make sure that the display is working, and that, that is what we're working on right now. To help us test the display, we will uh, go back again to the app node 8461. Uh, the app node mentions a program called LCD Image Converter, uh, but they don't provide any link to it. So after a bit of searching, I figured out that this is indeed the program that is available on SourceForge. So if you Google LCD Image Converter, you can download this program from SourceForge and uh, unpack it in the zip file, and then you'll get a view something like this. And very, very quick, um, this program can generate a, a header file with a, an array uh, with the byte value or bit values of your image of your choosing. So if we start by going to conversion here, we can set up um, the image type and I'm going to use color RAGAD8 here because I'm using all 24 bytes, uh, all 24 bits of my display uh, bus. And if we go to image here, um, I'll set the block size to 32 bits and you can set the byte order to big engine. Uh, if we set it to little engine, it will look uh, uh, a bit stripy. I have a picture of that. Um, but big engine is the one that is going to work so just press ok here uh, you can either draw an image in here or in my case I will go to Inkscape 
uh, a free vector image tool that I'm using uh, fairly much. So I will just open Inkscape here. Uh, I go to my document settings and set the size in uh, pixels. Set this to 480 by 272. And then we'll have a document that is the correct size. So this uh, here, I will just uh, do, uh, let me just check if I still have the test image around. No. Um, so I'll just do some rectangles like this. Uh, let me just adjust this like this and copy this to here and here and here. And then this one can be uh, this is green and this is a blue one and this is the red one. I'm going to do this uh, compound color like this. Uh, and I'll just write uh, across it, I'll write test like this, uh, set it to 200. No, I'll just do it as a matrix. And we can do this white, so like this. Now I have a test image. So what is very important now, I will go here and say export PNG image. Um, I can export this as uh, the PNG here, but um, if I mark this, it will say that you will just export my uh, my marking here. And this uh, document here is uh, 533 by 301 pixels. And my first mistake was to export the whole uh, shebang here. That gave me quite some headache. So make absolutely sure that this is set to the drawing area um, or the, the page area, sorry, uh, this is in Danish. But this image size should be uh, 480 by 272. Uh, export and replace. All right. Um, so this image I can now open in my uh, LCD image converter. So with the image uh, loaded here, we can just double check in the options conversion here that we are using the R8, uh, G8, B8. Um, preset uh, and I'll just go to convert and then uh, we can export this bitmap dot uh, h to where we want to and now I'll just put it directly into the uh, include folder of my project and call this and just just call it bitmap which is okay uh, and close down the program again so now we should be able to in the include folder here just press f5 you can see that the bitmap here is available so what we need to do is to scroll all the way down and then remove, just uh, comment this last section out. Remember to double check that this uh, has the right sizes because if you overlook this, you will have tremendously big problems. Uh, I was in that uh, situation. So save this and then uh, let's see how this goes. So now we have um, the image in here. Uh, we can go to our, uh, let's go to the source here, and we can just try to, to start this. Uh, let's just um, let's just try to debug this. Uh, I will just turn on the power supply for the, for the board. Like this. And then we can try to debug the board. So this is the first time we debug it, so we need to select the debug as uh, STM32 application. And let's just press OK here, and then we should have the right file or the right project that we debug. Let's have another look at the board. Um, yes, so we are programming the board right now. Still got the, the blank screen downloaded successfully, and now we are at the main breakpoint. So we can press uh, resume here, and nothing is happening on the screen. But I didn't expect that to happen. So let me just terminate this. We, can, we know now that everything works. Uh, let me go back into the hardware init.cpp here. Uh, I want to include uh, the bitmap, uh, the bitmap.h here, and if we go down to um, the frame buffer start address here, instead of having this, I just copy this uh, and commenting this out. Instead of pointing at the SDRAM access or uh, first address, I will uh, write view end. Uh, 32 underscore t and 
uh, then point it to the the bitmap address. Let me just see. That is called the uh, image data bitmap. So I'll just write image here and then use uh, control space to auto complete this. So now we are pointing the the frame buffer start address at the image start. Uh, and what we can see here over in the memory regions here, let me just try to rebuild this. We should see that we are indeed having the image inside the flash memory. Um, you can see we're now using 53% of, of the available space. And if we go to memory details over here, uh, you can see that we are uh, using in the RO data here, we are using image data bitmap is using 382.5 kilobytes of memory. So just for storing this single image, we will use quite uh, a lot of space, but it's in the processor. So now when we try to hit debug here, we should be pointing the frame buffer directly at this uh, address here. Let's see if we get an image. So the download takes uh, significantly longer. Let's try to start here and still no dice. So um, this is still not running. Um, let's see what we have done wrong. Just before I was greeted with a nice black screen. Uh, so that means that the, the screen is not on. And that is due to the fact, uh, you probably remember that we got this LCD underscore disk uh, GPIO output. So we, if we go to main.cpp and we find this uh, MX underscore uh, GPIO underscore init, you can see now that here uh, the LED test um, pin is set to high, so it's set, but the LCD underscore disk pin is set to reset. So if I just remove this, we can of course also change this in, in the cube IMX, uh, cube MX setup, but now we just change this to, to set. And um, the debugging here, I will go to debug configurations because uh, on a debugger here, we can say, uh, we can remove the tag of verify flash download because then uh, the, uh, the load will be faster. And also um, I will uh, in main here, uh, sorry, startup is it? Uh, set breakpoint at main. I'll remove this because then the program will just start right away uh, instead of having us uh, to, um, to to press resume first. So let's press uh, debug here. Uh, now we have uh, taken a few seconds off the the development time here, and of course it's nice to be able to to break uh, at main. But for this demonstration, it's easier just to to uh, to have it run as fast as possible. So it's downloading right now, and when it's downloaded, uh, this program should start, and we should see this test image. Yeah, so now it happens. Uh, the astute viewer here will see that the, the red and the blue are changed. So if I load up my uh, my test image, so this is a image, test image, we can just rotate this two times like this. You can see that the blue and the red colors are changed. And at first I thought that was uh, something to do with this, the display, but later on I found out that for some reason um, the, dis the colors will be right when you're using the TouchGFX application. So it's most likely something to do with, uh, with the LCD image converter program. So for now, uh, be happy if you have a, a display or a, a picture on your, on your screen. So this is uh, how to set up the hardware configuration and the uh, make sure that the display is working. Uh, I think I will stop the video for now and then do another video on the SDRAM and how to get that to work, or at least how I got my uh, system to work. So uh, thanks for watching.